for our memory. What do we know about TCP congestion control? The algorithm for how do we increase and decrease our sending rate, which really is increasing and decreasing the congestion window, because they're proportional, has different components. We saw that to we have additive increase where we, and may be shown by the, uh, the diagram where we have a linear increase in the sending rate. This is the idea then when there's no congestion, we're receiving acts, then increase our sending rate. If we have congestion, and due to packet losses, congestion is detected, then decrease the sending rate. And the general form is multiplicative decrease, where we halve the sending rate for every packet loss. But in fact, it's a little bit more detailed than that, because depending upon the type of packet loss, we respond in different ways. And in addition, we have the slow start phase, and that is there to rapidly increase the sending rate at the start of the connection, and, and during the connection in some cases. So if we just have additive increase, we have a slow increase, and therefore we may be inefficient in using our connection. So at the start, increase fast. And the result, if there's no packet loss, is that at the start of our connection, we start sending slow, but we rapidly increase the sending rate. We have another parameter called the slow start threshold, which tells us at what point do we switch from slow start to additive increase. Send rapidly increase the rate until you get to some cutoff level, and then just gradually increase the rate. And at some point you'll reach the advertise window. And remember it's the minimum of the two windows which limits our sending rate. And then in packet losses, two different types of events. Small amount of congestion, three duplicate acts. Large amount of congestion, timeout. We reduce by more in the event of a timeout. And we get similar to this in a simple case. Slow start, additive increase, packet loss due to three duplicate acts, halve the threshold, and set our window to the new threshold value. And then additive increase. If there's a loss due to a timeout, halve the threshold again, and revert back to the start. Minimum window, slow start, additive increase. So that's the basics of TCP congestion control. And in practice, that's the basics of the algorithm. There are many extensions. So there are many variations that try to improve the performance. Because really, this limits the congestion control algorithm and the flow control algorithm limit how fast we can send data using TCP. And because almost all of our internet applications use TCP, it has a large impact on the performance of our applications. So when you download a file from a website using BitTorrent, FTP, whatever, the throughput that you achieve is largely dependent on how TCP works, and especially TCP congestion control. Because if we start to get packet drops when you're downloading that file, then you the sender is going to slow down, and your throughput's going to go down. So it's about achieving this trade-off of getting a high throughput. We want a high throughput for our applications, but no congestion or avoid congestion. And that's what all the extensions to the congestion control algorithm have tried to achieve, different trade-offs between high throughput and avoiding congestion. We've just gone through the very basic steps of the algorithm. There are many extensions. Uh, it works well. The current TCP congestion control works well in the internet, where most of the packet losses are due to congestion. In other networks, like a wireless link, where you may have packet losses due to errors in the wireless link, it doesn't work so well. So in some wireless networks, using TCP 
the performance or the throughput can drop off and it's not good for applications. And there have been some variants of TCP to work just in wireless networks. Some, some modifications so that it's faster in a wireless LAN or maybe in a 3G network. And in some cases in very high speed networks, say uh, across optical fiber, it may perform poorly. When we have a few packet losses, it can slow down. And since our capacity is very high, in a high speed network, say greater than 10 gigabits per second, if TCP slows down, then it may be sending at a very low rate and be very inefficient compared to what our link can support. So in, there are some cases where it doesn't work so well, but there have been some modifications to try to handle those cases. In general, it works well. It works well in that it gives a good throughput for our applications but it avoids congestion. And over the time, there's been many, many variations to the algorithm to try and improve it. Uh, so the original TCP didn't have any congestion control. In 1988, they added slow start and the additive increase and fast retransmit, and they've added different features to TCP over time. And nowadays, there are many different algorithms available. The, the most common one, or the normal one, is called Reno, TCP Reno. Uh, but there are variations. Um, we will see maybe in a demo on Linux, there's two congestion control algorithms available. One's called Reno, and one's called Cubic. But you can install others. That is, you, when you set up your operating system, can select which variation of the congestion control algorithm to use, depending upon your network. Usually the default ones are, are suitable for most purposes, but if you have a, sp a special case that you want to deal with, then maybe you'll try a different algorithm. So there are others, okay? and it depends upon the operating system uh, as to which ones are available. Um, just quickly on Linux, we can see the set of congestion control algorithms. It's part of the operating system, so like in, in Windows, you have a registry that has operating system variables. In Linux, we have a set of variables which we can see with system control. And there's one called it's a networking parameter with IP version 4 called TCP. What is it called? TCP available. Available congestion control. If I can spell correctly. So this parameter is for my operating system that tells me my current OS has two algorithms available to choose from, Cubic or Reno. So the other one's available. Which one's in use? The current one in use is, is indicated by a different parameter. Current one in use by my computer is Cubic. So just two variables as parameters for my OS that tell me what's available and what's in use. And I can change by selecting the other one, Reno. So to change a variable in my operating system, I need to be the administrator or root user. So I use sudo in, in my computer. And syscontrol is to change the value, set the TCP congestion, congestion control parameter to Reno. And it's now set to Reno. So now my computer, when I use TCP, is using a different algorithm. In fact, Reno is the one or what the one that we described is very similar to what Reno is. Cubic is a more advanced one, so it operates different from what we've seen in the lectures. In your assignment, your 
task is to test the performance of a TCP connection, measure the throughput under different conditions. So you have a source computer, a destination computer, you use iPerf to send data using TCP and you measure the throughput and the basic test is to change the amount of packets which are dropped. So if you use TCP you'll get some throughput and normally in your simple network there should be no packets dropped. Okay? No congestion. You've just got a single link or to, to your router and another two links so there should be no congestion in your simple network. But what I'd like you to do in the assignment is to run some tests and see what happens with your throughput as the number of packets dropped increases. So if you draw your network, in fact for your assignment you can do it two ways. You can do it with your router and it's using wired links your client and server for iPerf, run iPerf on one computer, run it in the client mode on the other computer and run a test and you'll get a throughput for this uh, network, whatever it is, 80 megabits per second for example, and then see what throughput you get if there are packet drops. Okay. Because with packet drops, you know packet loss means that sender will slow down and therefore you'll be sending less and therefore your throughput should drop. By how much? That's the, the main experiment here. So what do you do to do that? How do you get packet drops? So normally in our network, there's no congestion in this very simple network. There's no one else sending no congestion, there should be no packet losses. So, for your experiments what I'd like you to do is to emulate packet losses. Pretend there are packet losses or, or introduce, um, introduce your own set of packet losses in here. And I'll show you two ways to do that. And what I'm showing, there are some links from your assignment web page to, to, to these instructions, so you don't have to copy them, copy them down. You, you can see them in more detail. But the idea is that what, what you want is, let's say we start iPerf on the client and server and we do our test. What happens if some packets are dropped in our network? Then you measure the throughput again, and let's say you get 70 megabits per second. And what happens if you increase the number of packets dropped? And you should measure the throughput and see what you get. So as a result, you'll get some plot as the number of packet drop, packets dropped increase, the throughput goes down. Or some relationship between packet drops, packet losses, and throughput. That's what I want you to get from the experiment, from the assignment. The challenge is how do you make packets be lost in the network when normally there's no congestion? What you do is there's two ways and the idea is to emulate packet drops. This is a, a more detailed picture. So here's your network, client, router, server. We have iPerf running on the client. What it does, it generates packets, sends them to TCP, and TCP follows its flow control and congestion control algorithm to work out when to send. Okay? And assuming the congestion control is the, the limiting factor for the how fast we can send, then we'll start in sending one segment per round trip time, and then in slow start phase, double the amount we send and double and reach additive increase and that will limit the throughput. What happens is TCP sends packets to IP and puts them into a queue and then your LAN card, as it can, takes them out of the queue and sends across the link to the router. The router receives those packets in some queue or some buffer 
and usually because there's no congestion at this router, it will transmit them Im immediately. Okay, in your network, there's no congestion here. If there are many other nodes sending into this router, there may be congestion and packets may be dropped here. And as they're sent to the server computer, they're received and iperf measures and counts how many packets it receives. That's the normal behavior. What you need to do is to introduce some packet drops. And there are two ways to do that. The first way is to use a program called TC. What TC does, and we saw it briefly in a demo last week, but TC is a program that manipulates this queue. Normally a packet comes into the queue. It's a first in, first out queue. So as packets arrive in the queue, the head of the queue is transmitted when the LAN card will allow it to be transmitted. So the normal way is IP puts it into the queue and as the LAN card becomes ready, it can transmit them. TC allows us to manage that queue. For example, what we could do is say packets which are destined to a specific address, send them first. Give some priority to packets. We're not going to do that in this assignment. That's another uh, topic. What we can do with TC also is add some, for example, some arbitrary delay to the packets here. And when I demonstrated the bandwidth delay product, that's what I did. I say when a packet comes in here, don't send it immediately, delay it for five, five milliseconds. As if there's an extra delay between client and server. The other thing you can do with TC is say, of all the packets that come into the queue, drop 1% of them. So it will randomly choose one out of every 100 packets that come into the queue and not send them, drop them, delete them. And that's what you want, or that's one way to emulate packet drops. You tell, you can do it either on the client, you can potentially do it on the router as well, if you have the software, and that you set up the queue such that some fraction of the packets that go through the queue are dropped or, or lost. And as a result, the server will not receive them. And as a result, TCP will take effect and start slowing down its sending rate. And that's how you'll measure the throughput and see how the number of packet drops impact upon throughput. So TC is one way to create arbitrary packet drops. There's a problem, though. It works if you can run it on the router. So if you run TC on the router, then it will drop the packets and TCP here will slow down and you'll see the impact of packet drops on congestion control. If you do it on the client, TCP is smart enough to recognize that the packet was dropped local to this computer. That this packet that was dropped is not due to congestion, it's due to something else happening inside this computer. And therefore TCP will not slow down. So in fact, using TC on the client computer does not impact upon TCP uh, in the way that we ex expect with congestion control. So I advise against using TC on the client computer. We need to do something else. So one option is to use TC on the router and that controls the number of packets which are dropped as the router sends them out. Another option to cause packets to be dropped on the client computer is to use another piece of software called IP tables. It's normally used as a firewall where we control which packets are allowed or are not allowed, i.e. which packets are accepted or dropped. Well, we can do that and we can say with IP tables, create a rule such that, what do we do? All packets sent to the LAN card, we can create a rule that says, again, 1% of those packets are dropped. Normally with a firewall, we say, all packets sent to some destination address are dropped. Or all packets coming from some destination uh, are dropped. We can also use IP tables to say, for example, 
all packets coming out of this interface to the LAN card, 1% of them are dropped. I'll quickly show you the, the command for doing that, uh, and then you can use that in your assignment. So you don't need to understand much about firewalls to do this, you just need to, to use the command, and then you can run your tests. Uh, what is the command? I will not show you how to use TC. There's some links on the website which show you how to use TC, but I, I, reckon, I recommend that you use uh, IP tables. It's just as easy. And again, the, the details of this command you can find on the, the assignment web page. But it's clear. Ah, I've made a mistake. And there's a mistake in this picture. We don't want to run IP tables on the, on the client. We want to run it on the server. Or, uh, because we have the same problem. If we drop packets here on the client, then the TCP here recognizes it's happening locally and will not slow down. So there's two ways. You run IP tables on the server and drop packets as they arrive. Or there's another way you can run it on the router or even as packets come back, the acts come back. But, so, this diagram's the best way is this green arrow should be pointing here. Run IP tables on the server. The idea is as packets come into the server, drop 1% of those packets. And the command. And I'd run this on the server computer. Add a rule such that the packets coming in, input to my computer, input to the server, and here we need to say, let's use a special mode that looks at the statistics of those packets. And let's randomly drop some of those packets with some probability. For example, 0.01, 1%. And take the action to drop them. What this command will do is say all packets coming into this computer, input coming in, let's look, let's use this statistics mode where we'll randomly select 1% of those packets and drop them as if they didn't arrive at that computer. So that's just the syntax of IP tables, the input, the mode is statistic uh, and random and the probability is 0.01 meaning 1% and the action drop those packets and then what IP, IP tables will do as packets come in every 100 packets or one it will look and drop a random selection of them 1% on average Does it work? What did I do wrong? My computer's not set up to run it. I have to test that. Uh, uh, let me check. Maybe it's the wrong version. Why doesn't that work? Mm. Yeah. Okay. That used to work. That's the problem with uh, running demos. That used to work. I have to find the exact syntax. Maybe it's updated since last year. It worked last year, but uh, I'll check the syntax and let you know tomorrow the, the right way to do that. It's possible that uh, you need to install uh, a new package to get that to work. It may have been available last time, but not this time. The idea is there. If it does work, if it did work, then what, no, that would be performed on the server. What happens as you send packets, they arrive here at this queue, 
IP tables drops 1% of them. Hence, TCP doesn't receive them here, and hence, eventually, this TCP will slow down. And you'll measure the throughput, and you, then you can change it. Instead of dropping 1%, drop 2% and increase the rate at which you drop packets and see how that impacts on the throughput. So it turns out if we can get IP tables to work that it's quite easy to run those experiments. You just keep changing the percentage or the, pack, uh, the probability of packet drop and measure the throughput with iperf. I'll get back to you tomorrow on how to do that. Uh, on the latest version. Any questions on that? So, in summary, use IP tables to drop packets on the server and then run iperf to measure the throughput. Yep. Uh, okay, and use, use the LAN to get more predictable results in this case. So, in fact, you have two options. You can use your router here and two cables. You can also do the same test connecting the two computers direct together. If you can set them up, you don't even need the router. Because unless you want to run TC on the router, which you can do, but it's a bit harder, then you can set up like this with two LAN cables or remove the router and one LAN cable client to server and run the same test. Okay. Um, just note that when you connect client to server together, note what the LAN speed is. Is it 100 megabits per second or 1,000 megabits per second? It may be different. Okay. Any other questions? So there's your assignment. Uh, is there a demonstration on how to use TC on the router? Uh, TC on the router. Uh, you, need, you would need to install TC on the router. The, the command for TC on the router is the same as on uh, Linux. Okay, it's a Linux operating system on the router. But OpenWRT doesn't have it installed by default. So you would need to install TC. So you'd need to go to the OpenWRT website to find out how to install that. It's possible. Uh, once it's installed, then the command for running TC, you can find there's a link from the assignment website that shows how to run TC uh, to drop packets. Okay? But you'll need to install it first. Uh, if you want to install it and if you have troubles, then let me know. I, I, it's not too hard to install packages. Uh, but test it first to make sure it works. Uh, it may be a different version or an older version. Any other questions? So everyone can do the assignment. Okay. Okay. After tomorrow, once I get IP tables working, everyone can do the assignment. <laughs> okay. And to get more marks, then well, now, how many tests you do? You don't just run five tests and that's it. So try and investigate different factors. The packet drop is one thing. You can try the different congestion control algorithms. I showed you that there are two by default, Cubic and Reno. I recall last year a group installed two other algorithms and they gave results of the packet drop with Reno, with Cubic and two others. So you can try different congestion control algorithms and see how they work and which ones are better in the presence of packet drops. And there may be a few other things you could try, but they are the two main things. And there's another part, the fairness part, and that's what we want to discuss now. And this is not too complex. So now, in summary, you don't control, as the user, you don't control how fast TCP sends. The operating system, the implementation of TCP controls how fast it sends, and it's dependent upon what's happening in the network and at the receiver. What about when you have 
multiple TCP connections running at the same time? How do they compete with each other? That's one aspect of fairness. An example. Here we have three source computers wanting to send data to three destination computers. So the top one to the top one here. Uh, so we're going to have three TCP connections running at the same time. And in this case, the three connections are going to share one bottleneck link. So let's say that this link here is the slowest of all of them. This is 100 megabits per second, 100, 100, and this is just one megabit per second. So we'd say this is the bottleneck link for all the connections. So the throughput of each TCP connection is going to be limited by that bottleneck link. If the bottleneck link was one megabit per second and we ran just one TCP connection from this computer to this top one approximately what throughput would they get? So if it was if those computers were labeled A, B, C, D and F if we had a TCP connection from A to D approximately what throughput would we get? Approximately. There may be some overheads which we cannot easily calculate, but throughput, if I do an iPerf test from computer A, this top one, to the top one on the right, computer D, what throughput would we get? What? Assuming the others aren't sending anything, so ignore the other computers. If this link data rate is one mega, 100 megabits per second, this is 100, and the bottleneck link is this one, one megabit per second, then we're limited by this bottleneck. So the throughput's going to be about one megabit per second. A little bit less because there'll be overheads. Assuming no, because there'll be no congestion in here, because there's no one else is sending. So we'd get about one megabit per second from A to D. What if all three are sending? A is sending to D, B to this one, and the lowest one to this one. All three are sending, all going by this one bottleneck throughput. What do you think A to D is going to get? One third. Okay. We have a bottleneck link, and we ideally would expect that under the same conditions each of the three connections would share that bottleneck link fairly amongst them. So they'd get one third each or 330 kilobits per second. Okay, And that's the issue of fairness. If that happens we'd say this system is fair because everyone gets a fair portion of that capacity. And in fact with TCP when all conditions are, uh, are the same in an ideal case that is true that we will get that. TCP is considered fair. Fair amongst connections. Okay. So in the green one, the blue one and the red one would all get approximately equal throughput when they share this bottleneck link. So TCP is fair, but fair amongst connections. So if we have N connections sharing some link with R bits per second, then each connection would achieve R divided by N bits per second. We divide the capacity by the number of connections by N. And that's true, at least in ideal conditions. Ideal con conditions means, for example, the connections have the same round trip time. From A to D and from B to E, the round trip time is the same. And the same size segments, so they're sending the same size segments across their links and there's no other traffic, then TCP is fair in those cases. If we have different round trip times, it becomes more complicated. 
usually connections with a smaller round trip time may get a s slightly larger proportion of the bandwidth or capacity. And it becomes more complicated if there are sources sending data which are not using TCP. For example, some are using UDP. Like a voice over IP call is using UDP but no TCP, then some of the TCP connections may not get equal proportion as what the others get. It becomes more complicated. And importantly, TCP is fair amongst connections only. If there are applications using multiple TCP connections, then although it's fair amongst connections, it's not amongst the applications. And a simple example. I'm using this computer. I run an application that opens two TCP connections at the same time to the server on this computer. So my application is designed to use not just a single connection, but two connections, the two green ones. And because TCP is fair amongst connections, of these four connections sharing this bottleneck link, each of them get about a quarter of capacity. That's what we've said before about fairness amongst connections. So the, this first green one gets 250 kilobits per second, the second one 250, and the last two, the blue and the red ones, 250. So the green one, the blue gets 250, and the red gets 250. TCP is fair amongst those four connections. The one megabit per second divided by four connections. But my application on this computer gets a total of 500. Because my application, let's say it's a web browser trans downloading data or transferring data between another application, a server, if it's using two connections at the same time, the total my application is getting is 500 kilobits per second. This is not fair amongst applications. The application on computer C, the red one, is getting 250. On computer B, the blue one, is getting 250. On computer A, the green one, is getting 500. So the end users are not treated fairly in this case. And TCP doesn't try and handle that. So what do you do if you want to increase your throughput for your application on your computer? Your download, for example, from server to, to your application, what do you do? How do you get higher throughput when you're using TCP? Add more connections. Add more connections. So if you can get an application, both client and server, that use more connections, then in this case, then the more connections you get, the higher the throughput that your application gets when sharing with others. If the red one realizes I'm only getting a quarter of this capacity, then install an application that uses three connections. Okay? The red one, if they use three connections, then we have a total of six connections sharing that link. The red one is going to get a half the green one two-thirds and the blue one one-third. And that's how download managers can increase the, their performance. And we'll see later peer-to-peer -peer file sharing applications. By having multiple TCP connections, you can increase the throughput for your application. Okay. So TCP is fair amongst connections, but not necessarily against applications amongst applications. Now, what stops an application from using multiple TCP connections? Well, if the green one has increased to two and the red one realizes, okay, I'm not getting as much as that other person, then I increase mine to three, then the blue one says, I'm not getting as much as the others, I increase mine to ten. And then everyone increases the number of connections. But note, for each connection, there's some overhead. So having an infinite number of connections produces an infinite overhead in this case. So you cannot just keep increasing. So 
there's some overhead of having more connections, more complexity at the client and server, and more overhead in setting up the connection. So, in general, applications should be designed to take into account the fact that other applications will be in use in the internet. But as you see, download managers, some applications will open multiple connections. Web browsers nowadays open multiple connections. But usually, for example, to download images in a web page, you download the HTML, the multiple images in separate connections. It speeds up the transfer in some cases, although for different reasons. So you can investigate this in your assignment. Again, you can so instead of having multiple computers you just have multiple instances of IPER you open up three terminals for example and same on the server you run three instances of IPER use different port numbers and then on the client three different instances of iperf so effectively you have three three separate tcp connections across the same bottleneck link and you should see that they get about a third of the capacity so you can increase the number of connections and see how that works and then you can do different things to see what happens if we change some parameters for example there's different options what happens if we also have a UDP data transfer across that connection. And for UDP, you use the minus U option in iperf. Or what happens if one of these connections runs for 10 seconds and one runs for 60 seconds and you repeat the, run, the connection that runs for 10 seconds six times? So run for 10 seconds, stop, start a new one for 10 seconds, do that six times, while the other TCP connection is running all at once for 60 seconds. So there's a variation that you can do and see, does that impact upon the, through, the fairness? Do they get different throughputs? And you can try a number of different things to see what happens when you have different combinations of TCP and UDP connections across that link and how does the throughput get affected? And as a result, how is the fairness? So that's the second part of your assignment. And, and you can do that. You don't need IP tables to do that. You can do that now. Yep. So yes, you would need three instances of the server there. And in that case, you must set a port number. Because when you start the client, you need to say which instance of the server to connect to, and you do that using a port number. Not So, iperf server port number 123, port number 124, 125, so they did, must be different port numbers. And at the client, when you connect, you specify the destination port number using again the minus p option so there's a port number option minus p in fact you don't have to start multiple instances i think there's even an option in iperf to start multiple instances to, to run multiple tcp connections so there's another option you can you can check in iperf to run multiple tcp connections at the same time okay so there are different combinations yeah, you, so you, iperf will in fact do it for you, run n connections. So that's one way to test. So this is the manual approach. And what some students last year did was they start to write some scripts that will do it automatically for them. So put it in a for loop for i equal 1 to 10, start iperf. And same with the client. So you just run one script and it does all your tests for you. So I may be able to find some of their work from last year and see if I can find a script that you can use to do that. 
but think about how you can combine multiple connections in different ways. There are different, many different combinations that will give interesting insights. Any, any other questions on this issue of TCP fairness? So TCP is fair amongst connections, but when we have different parameters, or mo uh, it's when we have different parameters like round trip time and uh, packet size, or using other protocols like UDP, it may not be fair. <coughs> Try and investigate that. Let's finish. IP does not have any congestion control built in. If, if we had no congestion control in TCP, then the internet would not work because everyone would send as fast as possible and there'd be congestion and too many packets dropped. So that's where the internet relies on TCP. And it works because most of the traffic in the internet is TCP traffic. So it's been su very successful in providing congestion control on the internet. There are a number of cases where it doesn't work so well. As you start to get applications that no longer follow the rules of TCP congestion control, then that creates problems. Or you start to have multiple connections, many connections from a single application then in some parts of the internet it becomes unfair for some users and the performance may degrade. Like web browsers opening many connections at once, many applications starting to use UDP which impacts upon TCP and peer-to-peer -peer applications having many connections. So they m m cause problems for TCP. We will see in the last topic some peer-to-peer -peer applications, BitTorrent for example, and in the next or tomorrow, multimedia applications. Voice over IP for example. Let's stop there on TCP. What's the next topic? Yeah, let's go home now. <laughs> this is the topic we're going to go through quite quickly. In fact, we'll just introduce the concept of multicast today, and, and we may even finish there. There are, in fact, two sides of it, multicast and quality of service. We will not try to describe quality of service or the techniques for it. If you don't understand the, the term, it's about giving priority to different applications or users. All the packets that Steve sends across the internet or across SIT's network make sure they go first or go before the packets sent by students. That's one of the examples of quality of service or where it can be used. Give priority to the packets of particular users. The users that pay more get higher priority than others. We will not go through, we don't have time to cover the, the details of that. Multicast is easy as well. Send to multiple people. And it becomes easy when we compare it to the alternative methods. So let's just introduce the different addressing and delivery mechanisms that we have. And that will lead us to how multicast works. And then we'll mention how it's, or where it's important. So there are four different ways that we uh, can address our destination and deliver data to a destination in, in any network. The first one is what we almost always assume, unicast. Unicast 
means there is a one-to-one -one association between an address and a host. My it may be that may be a bit too general, more a an address and an interface of a host may be more specific. For example, my my laptop, its interface has one address associated with it, an IP address, for example. And when someone wants to send to that interface on my laptop, they use that one IP address. This is the most common form of how we deliver data and what we normally assume. But when someone specifies a destination address, that destination address means a particular host on the internet, one host. So I have one interface, a cable going into my device. It has an address associated with it. That address refers to a single interface or more generally a single host on the internet. When a source creates a packet to send and they set the destination address in that packet if they set it to this, what we say, this unicast address, 1.1.1, one, dot one, dot one, dot one, then that packet should be delivered just to one computer in the network. If it's a unicast address, then it means that this packet will go to one device in the network, one host. And that's available in the internet protocol, all the example IP addresses that we usually give are unicast addresses. Here's a unicast address. If you set the destination of some IP datagram to be 125.70.16.3, then it should be delivered to a particular host with that address, just one host. Uni meaning one. Similar when we use the MAC protocol or an ethernet protocol, if a frame has a destination address of this 0017, so on to 89, then that frame should be delivered and processed by just one host in the network. If a host receives a packet or a frame to which it is not the unicast destination, that host should discard that packet. If my address is 125.70.16.3, my address, and I receive a packet where the destination is not that value, I will discard it. Unicast is the normal mode uh, in which we send and, uh, or address and deliver packets. Broadcast is another mode where we send to everyone in a network. So we have a one-to-many association between address and hosts. We have one address when we set that as the destination address, that packet should go to many hosts. And in this case, many means every host on the network. So we have a network on the board here with four hosts. 1.1.1.1, one dot, one dot, one dot, one, 2, 3 and 4, four different hosts with IP addresses. If this one wants to send to everyone on the network, what does it set the destination address to be? If host with address 1114 wants to send to everyone else, what's the destination address? All ones in binary. In binary, we're talking about IP addresses. All ones in binary, yes, that's correct. And in an IP address, that is in IP address. An IP address. 
all ones in binary is 32 ones. When we convert it to dot or decimal, that is 255.255.255. If this source wants to send everyone, everyone in its network, it can set the destination to be this special address, this special IP address, a local broadcast address. And the result should be that everyone, everyone else, it doesn't have to receive it, but everyone else in the network receives a copy of that packet. That's the idea here. So there's a one-to-many mapping, or sorry, many-to-one. Many, I'm getting confused. One to many association between addresses and hosts. This address, this one address, maps to many hosts. And in this case, many means all or all other. So that's the idea of broadcast. I think everyone understands broadcast, send to everyone else. There are other ways that we can do this. In IP, there are two types of broadcast addresses. This is called a local broadcast, means send to everyone on your network. There's also a directed broadcast, and it depends upon the net mask. It may be this. If, the, if it's a slash 24 address, a directed broadcast means the network portion followed by all ones in binary, which is 255 in this case. So this should also send to those, those three. So there are in fact two forms of broadcast addresses in IP. There's a send to everyone on your network and send to everyone on a specific network. But both are using broadcast. And when this host with address 1111 receives this datagram, even though the destination address doesn't match it, because the destination address is a special address, it accepts and processes that packet. Okay. Whereas with unicast, if you receive a packet and the destination doesn't match your address, you discard that packet. There's also broadcast at the LAN layer, the LAN level. With Ethernet, there's a broadcast address, all Fs in hexadecimal or all ones in binary, 48 ones or the all Fs address. That is when you set an, a destination address to be this in the Ethernet frame, then that frame should be delivered to everyone on that LAN. So broadcast, one to many, where many means everyone. Where do we use it? Mainly in controlling networks, managing networks, exchanging information in protocols, for example, when we're doing routing, when we are looking up addresses, DHCP, ARP, some of you would have seen using broadcasts in those cases. So in the control and management of the networks, broadcast is used. But it's very inefficient if we have to use broadcast a lot because we send one packet and possibly many are sent across the network. So we have to be careful when we use it. It's usually only allowed within one LAN. I cannot send a broadcast packet to everyone in the internet. Okay? It's, there's no, no concept of that because it would be very inefficient, a security problem. So broadcast is usually inside a LAN or maybe in special cases, to a specific LAN. So we have unicast, one to one, broadcast, one to all, and multicast, which is a subset of all. One to many, same as broadcast, a one to many association between address and hosts. There is one address, which represents many hosts, but in this case, many is not all, it's a selection of the hosts a subset of the hosts. So in fact, it's a more general form of broadcast. So broadcast can be covered by multicast if, 
if the selection of hosts includes all of them, then it's in fact broadcast. Now, this is more complex because which hosts are in the set? Well, you need some form for the hosts that want to receive the packet to subscribe or join some group. So we have a group of hosts. So it becomes more complex than broadcast. Let's try and draw a picture. Our same four computers, I'll just call them. Then if we some have if we have some way where hosts can join some group, a multicast group, let's say we have a multicast group. And in this case, it includes hosts 4, 1, and 3. All right, we only have 4 to choose from here. Then, actually make it simpler, just 1 and 3. The multicast group contains hosts 1 and 3 of these 4. And then this source host creates a packet and sets the destination address of that packet to be, let's give this group a name, group A. If this is multicast group A and it contains hosts 1 and 3, if we set the destination to it at a special address, identifying multicast group A, then the idea is a copy of that must be sent to 1 and 3, not to 2. Okay. Broadcast, it would go to 1, 2 and 3, Multicast, it goes to a selection of those hosts. So the difficulty arises is, how do we know which hosts it goes to? So we need this concept of a multicast group. And we need some way for normally hosts to join a group. Which hosts should be in group A? Well, maybe host 1 will jo join or subscribe to that, that group, and so will host 3. And then we need some way to keep track of who is in that group. And there are different ways for doing that. So the concept is that we have some group of hosts, and when we send a packet to a special address which identifies that group, it will be delivered to every host in that group. In IP addresses, there is a special set of IP addresses that are reserved for multicast. This was an example of a special case broadcast address for IP. In IP addresses, the, the IP addresses that start with greater than 224, so the first dotted decimal number, are reserved for multicast addresses. So a special set of addresses. So what we have is one IP address that represents a group of hosts. So where it says destination A, it would be a special multicast address. For example, the one on the screen, 225, 70, 8, 20. Where this multicast address is associated with a selection of hosts one and three in this case. So we create an IP datagram, set the destination to this multicast address, and the network should deliver that packet to everyone in that multicast group. IP has multicast addresses, so does uh, Ethernet. So the MAC addresses, there are special case multicast addresses as well. So when a host sends a datagram to that one address, it should be delivered to all hosts subscribed to that group. So one to many, but many is a selection of the hosts. 
This is useful for multimedia applications. Streaming of radio, for example. Let's say there's an online radio station and there's many people listening to that station at the same time, radio or even TV. Then there's one source, the radio station, and there are many subscribers to that channel. They're listening to the radio. They're listening and should receive the same content. So there's a source, a single source. There's a multicast group which contains all the people listening to that radio channel at the same time. And if the packets contain the audio content, the source sends one copy, and everyone in the group should receive a copy. So multicasts is beneficial for multimedia applications where you're sending data from one to many, streaming of uh, TV, audio, and so on. And some collaborative applications where you share data between multiple users, and it's the same data. So document editing and so on. Uh, presentations. So there's one presentation that's going to multiple computers at the same time. Then there's one source. It goes to a selection of the hosts in some network. So unicast, one to one. One address represents one host. Broadcast, one to many, where one address represents many hosts, and in this case, many is all, that's broadcast. And multicast, also one to many, but many means just a, a subset of the hosts, a selection of the hosts. It's more complex than the other two in that we need some way for hosts to join or subscribe to a multicast group. And also for the network to keep track of who's in that group. Last one, Anycast. What is that? Still one to many. There's one address that represents many hosts. Anycast is a special case where I send a packet to one address and that address can cover many hosts. I only need that packet to be delivered to one of those hosts, any of those hosts in that group. So again, there's a group of destinations, destination hosts, but we only need to get the data to just one of them, any of them, not necessarily to all of them. Multicast, we need to get the data to all of the hosts in the group, any cast to any host in a group. And the main purpose of this is in very specialized applications like DNS. I think most people understand with DNS, you send a query, you have a domain name, www.google.com. You send a query to a DNS server, and that DNS server returns the IP address. That's the basics of DNS. But we can have multiple DNS servers for redundancy, for performance. There may be, no, there are. There are thousands of DNS servers across the internet. So what we can do with Anycast, I create one query, I send it to an Anycast group, which includes many DNS servers. I don't care which DNS server responds, just as long as one of them responds, any one of those DNS servers respond. So that's an example of where Anycast can be used. And these four delivery mechanisms are captured in this diagram where the green host is the source and the red ones are the ones who should or are potential destinations. Any cast we send to one destination. So here's our network. Broadcast we want to send our data to all destinations or all other hosts. Multicast to a subset or a selection of the hosts in the network, and any cast to a selection or to any one from a selection of the hosts. So the orange ones and the red one are in the potential destination group. We care about getting a packet to just to any one of them. If it goes to two of them, that's fine, but if it just reaches one of them, that's also sufficient. So the main forms of addressing and delivery in the, net, in the internet and in fact in any network.
not just the internet. Let's finish with one example of multicast. Here's an um, example of multicast in the internet. We have a source. Let's say it's a server that's sending data for a, a live video stream. And there are many hosts that, want to, uh, that are trying to watch that same live video stream. So they all want to receive the data, the same data. So if they're all part of a group, group one in this case, so there are other hosts in this internet, these are routers, there are many other hosts, but the ones shown here are all part of a particular multicast group, group one. Then the idea is that the source sends one copy of the packet. Source address, S1, it's coming from S1. Destination, G1. G1 is a multicast group address. And there are IP addresses for multicast groups. It sends one copy of the IP packet to the router. It's the first router. That router, if it knows information about who is in this group, then what it does, it recognizes. To reach the destinations in this group, I need to send a copy of the packet in this direction, because there's a host here that should receive a copy, and another copy of the packet in this direction, because I know that there are hosts in this direction that need to receive a copy as well. So this router must know something about the multicast group. With normal unicast and even broadcast, we don't need any special knowledge about who's in a multicast group. So it's much easier. But with multicast, the routers need extra information to know where the destinations are. This router sends a copy to the next router who recognizes, OK, destination is group 1. The hosts in group 1, there's one here, there's one in this direction, and there's some in this direction. And so it sends three copies of that packet that it received one, it sends three copies. One will go to the host here, and we'll see eventually these two other hosts receive it. So one source sent one packet, and all five hosts in the multicast group received a copy. So that's using multicast. For that to work, somehow these hosts need to tell the routers that they want to be in group one. So that these routers know where to send a copy of the packet. This one knows you don't need to send a copy in this direction because if we send in this direction, we'll eventually reach the destinations. So in fact, there are special multicast routing protocols to handle that. But it becomes complex. And the diagram on the previous slide is the one shown in the top here. This is using multicast. The source sent one, cop sent one copy of the packet. The first router sends two copies of that same packet. The, third, well, the second router sends three copies. This one sends one copy. And we see in total there are one, two, three, ten packets sent in the network in this simple example. So to deliver from one source to the five destinations, there was ten packets sent in the network using multicast. What if we didn't use multicast and instead used unicast? We want to achieve the same goal of the source wants to deliver that packet to the five destinations. If we didn't have multicast, it would look like this. In fact, here the source shows four packets being sent. It should be five here. Okay, there are five destinations. We would send one packet to D1, a second packet to D2, to D3, and to D5, and D4. Source would send five copies of the same data to this router. 
this router would send one copy to D1, and the other four would go to this router, and eventually they'd go to the destinations. Count the number of packets sent in the network. Should be 5, 10, 13, 17, 19 packets sent in the network. To get the same data from one source to the five destinations, if we don't use multicast, the bottom case, there are 19 packets sent in the network. All destinations receive one copy of that packet. If we use multicast, there are just 10 packets sent in the network, which is better, less overhead. We don't have to send as much to get the same data to the destinations. So multicast can be much more efficient in using the network because now expand this up to 100 or 1,000 hosts across the internet, then using unicast, it can be very inefficient. With multicast, much more efficient. So multicast, much more efficient than using unicast, but it's more complex in that these routers must know of the members of the multicast group. And that adds complexity to multicast in the internet. We're not going to describe how the IP multicast works in any more detail than that. Just the concepts of what it is and what the benefits and, and disadvantages are. We will see it in use when we look at multimedia applications. So in fact on this topic, we will stop there on this topic. And tomorrow what we'll do is we'll move on to the next topic, which is multimedia applications. And we'll see when we look at, for example, IPTV, multicast is used. And we'll see it in a more detailed example then.